So in case you haven't had an opportunity to listen to the discussion on my takeaway from Ephesians 1, this is going to be a little difficult to sit through, considering that uh, each one of these talks in sequence will be building on the information that we've covered in the previous time. So to quickly set the stage, when we talked about Ephesians, the main takeaway that I was hoping to bring from the text was that according to the author of Ephesians, salvation, justification, grace, and all of those things were reiterated to be solely a miracle that was done by God to the believer. And that covers a lot of really rife ground for people to argue about things such as predestination, free will, and those types of things. And I don't have much of an interest in engaging into the, the philosophical implications of exactly when, how, and where each of the steps of the sortiriology lands in what sequence and how mechanically the whole thing works. Because to the author of Ephesians 1, it was most important that the reader or the audience of this letter understood that the main thing that that there was to meditate on, think on, was that their role was to receive a miracle that was done by God, and only that. So salvation, justification, and everything that goes along with that was accomplished in and through God, and nothing else. The author is going to continue... And today, we're only going to cover a short part of Ephesians 2, and we're only going to take away the one thing from Ephesians 2, but we will be reviewing Ephesians 2 and the pericope, which is, again, a fancy word for the window of uh, text that we'll be looking at today is Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. Ephesians 2. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus." For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Before we engage fully with the text, we there are some things to consider uh, about uh, the city of Ephesus, the nature of the letter. And what possibly the the authorial intent or occasion, as they like to say in theology, this letter was written for. I spent probably more time than anybody wanted to uh, on on the difficulties and, and challenges that some people see with who specifically the author of the epistle of Ephesians is, and I don't plan to do much more on it moving forward, but to review, uh, it is generally understood that Paul was the writer of this letter in some substantial, significant, real way. However, we, what we will see is that Paul's particular theology is of much less importance um, when we evaluate what the what the crux of his arguments are, 
And we'll get into that. And But in order to do that, we need to somewhat understand the cultural background to which this letter is being received. So whenever you're dealing with a biblical text, there's a cultural background that the author has, and he is writing out from his cultural background, meaning he's writing with his life experiences in mind, his inner thoughts in mind, his theological background in mind, his family history, his religious history. All of that is from from where the words that landed on the manuscript were derived. As the receivers of that text, we have the disadvantage of not being able to read the author's mind. What we can do is use the best of our senses, the best of our research, and the best information available to us in our time to understand what someone like this author might have been thinking about when producing this letter to a group of Christian believers in a city like Ephesus. Now, why would I say something like a city like Ephesus? In the, in the interest of being intellectually honest, I must point out that some of the early manuscripts that represent evidence for this letter of the Epistle to the Ephesians <clears throat> do not always mention that it was written to the city of Ephesus. And there have been many, many theories about why this might have been. There, I remember I read one theory that said, well, this was a circular letter. So what? It, so when we say circular, almost think of like the form letter that you get when you get uh, when you get terminated from your job, or when you get your uh, when you get your rejection letter from college. I don't know why all my examples are such negative, but you understand what I mean by a form letter. A form letter that says, "Dear blank, we regret to inform you that your application has been declined. However, should you decide to." Uh, should you decide to apply for future opportunities, feel free to submit your application after a year's time to blah, 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 blah at blah.com. It's a form letter. And so the theory goes that the epistle to the Ephesians wasn't really an epistle to the Ephesians. It was an epistle that was written that ended up in Ephesians but was written to a larger group of churches that would that was to be expected to circulate throughout this network of churches and believers. It's not an entirely implausible idea, which is to say, if we know anything about Ephesus, which we hope to learn here, you can see why someone might do that that way. The Ephesus was a port city. And it was the third largest city in the in, in its time. It was the third largest city in uh, Asia Minor of the time. So when you think of Alexandria, it was right behind Alexandria. And it being a port city and it being a large cultural center in the ancient world, we understand it to have been a melting pot type of society which meant that there were people coming and going from different walks of life all the time. There was almost as many people, give or take, coming and going from the city as people that actually lived in the city. And so you constantly had religious synchronism and cultural exchange and people who spoke multiple languages, people of different religions interacting with each other, arguing with each other, and then trying to figure out how to commune with each other and determine whether or not they could commune with each other at all. And so this letter most likely ended up landing in Ephesus. You can see why you might send a letter like this to a city like Ephesus, because it could then be redistributed throughout the ancient world from a port city. There's one problem with a port city. And there's one problem with all that cultural exchange that's going on. Your community of Christian believers are going to constantly be interacting with aberrant theology, different ideas, and people who are uncomfortable with their teachings and what their way of life. 
how do we address this and how do we keep these groups of people together believing and trusting on the miracle that that the author claims is being done on them and in them by God. Remember, that's what we talked about in chapter one. So the idea is send them a letter that makes sure that they understand exactly what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And when it lands in this port city of Ephesus, faithful people will probably copy it and redistribute it. This probably is the most likely explanation as to why some of the earliest copies of the letter to Ephesians that we have do not include to the saints who are at Ephesus. Either it was sent and never included Ephesus, and that term was added later, or it had the term and it was subsequently removed as the letter was redistributed throughout Asia Minor. In either case, the theology of the letter doesn't change, the message doesn't change, and the authorial intent doesn't change because ultimately it is highly likely that one way or another this letter was intended to be read and meditated on to people who believed as Christians in Ephesus. And when we draw that conclusion, we can then start to think about the culture that was in Ephesus at the time. Because remember, the author, who most likely was Paul, has a cultural background, which, by the way, is Second Temple Judaism. He is a converted Second Temple Jew. And if you're listening to this and you're not really familiar why I make that distinction, I encourage you to look it up. I don't have that much time to get into the intricacies and nuances of being a Second Temple Jew versus an ancient Israelite versus a Roman versus a Hellenistic Jew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Suffice it to say that all of the things that a Second Temple Jew would have been learning and studying and practicing and believing are bouncing around in Paul's head as he's writing this letter, and again, Paul or someone like Paul, are bouncing around in his head and then we need to understand the receiving context for that letter, which is all of the ideas, all of the theologies, all of the problems, and all of the, all of the different ideas that would have been bouncing around in the receiver's head. The receiving audience has just as much of a life bouncing around in their head as the author, Paul. And so how would they hear this letter and how would the author expect them to receive it? Well, Ephesus being a port city, we know that there's all kinds of ideas that are bouncing around in their head. And somewhere along the way, there was a community of people who started to believe that Jesus of Nazareth died on the cross for their sins, was buried and resurrected in hopes of inaugurating a new creation, which ultimately God will bring from heaven to earth. That is what they came to believe. It being Ephesus, though, that message is going to be disputed greatly amongst your neighbors, your friends, and your family members, some of which might be Second Temple Jews, or some of them might be diehard worshipers of the patron deity Artemis. I don't want to get anyone confused here. I am not an expert on ancient Roman and Greek Hellenistic gods and deities, demonesses, etc. I am not your guy for all that information. But what's really important is to understand in the ancient world, say you had a city like New York City. Well, we might say there's basically two large uh, consortiums of religious thought that are in New York City. And I know New York City is a large city, but if we were to do the statistics, you'd have two major religions that dominate New York City and the New York City area. People are either Christian of some sort, Roman Catholic, all the way up to Quakers, lots of uh, self-professing Christians in New York City, or there's some type of self-professing Jew. 
right? And everything along those spectrum, there's those two ideas. Now, if we go to Huntsville, Alabama, well, I mean, just everybody's Southern Baptist. And although that kind of gets at the idea, it's not quite what it was like in the ancient world. See, in the ancient world, for the most part, you had this pantheon of gods. You had Zeus, uh, and then you would have somebody like Hercules, who, yes, I know if you're a god geek, if you're a deity geek, I know that he's not fully de deified or whatever. Um, or you might have someone like Mercury, et cetera. You might have all, you have all this mythology. And what would happen was that each of the ancient cities would just sort of pick their favorite. And usually their favorite, or what we'll call patron god, was a god or goddesses that sort of kind of reflected their personality and their needs in that area anyways. So what kind of a city was Ephesus? Well, Ephesus was a port city. And there was lots of transient uh, people coming and going. And if you've read the New Testament through before, even amongst religious leader, adultery was a big problem. And if you read some of Paul's letters in the New Testament, he makes a big deal about sexual immorality being a problem in and outside of the church. So, for instance, in Jesus' day, Jesus was very, very adamant about there being a mitigating set of ethics around the institution of divorce. And partly the context of that was that you could have your different girlfriend in a different area code, as it were, to borrow a phrase and butcher it. So if I were to go to New York City tomorrow, I would just have my New York City wife. And if I were to go to Huntsville, Alabama, I would have my Huntsville, Alabama wife. And if I needed to go to San Francisco, maybe I have my San Francisco boyfriend. And every part of that was okay. Now imagine a city like Ephesus, where about half the population was somebody traveling from one place to another. Well, as it turns out, Ephesus' patron god, goddess, was Artemis. And Artemis was, among her other qualities, her main thing was fertility and sensuality. And that makes sense because there was so much commerce and trade around providing people an outlet to act out sexually while they're on the road, while they're passing through. I'm an ancient Near Eastern person and I'm in the first century uh, and I'm in the first century, I'm in first century Asia Minor. It would be completely normal for me to stop through Ephesus along my way and pick up a prostitute while I'm there. It's part of the reason I took the trip in the first place. I love my job. And so, so much of the culture at Ephesus was based around providing tourists and commercial merchants sensuality, lasciviousness, and immoral outlets that eventually this, this goddess Artemis came to represent the city in such a way. Again, the, the city's behavior started to define the type of deity that represented them best over time. And this is not uncommon. For instance, there are other cities where their patron deity would be some type of warrior god. And that's because that particular city-state or that particular culture really loved conquering, so on and so forth. So I don't mean to make it sound like Ephesus was a particularly odd or a special case in the ancient world. It's important to understand that when a city like Ephesus adopts a patron deity, there's usually a reason behind it. And that helps us understand the context to which our author is writing, and that's our receiving context. You've got this melting pot of Christians, Second Temple Jews, you've got people that worship Artemis conveniently, and you have other people that, that, may, that are coming in and they have their own ideas and theologies based on their city's patron deity. As we understand it, our author of Ephesians is not dumb. He knows this. So as he's writing Ephesians, he knows what type 
of context he's writing this letter to. As we know, or perhaps I'm informing you, the earliest Christians were a sect of Second Temple Jews, which is to say the earliest Christians were Jews that came to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Keep in mind that when we say that sort of thing, there is no New Testament for them to read. They only have the Hebrew Bible. And these earliest Christians reading the Hebrew Bible came to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah that was going to usher in the kingdom of God. Well, that's a problem for some of the other practicing and devout Jews in their, in their cultures, because we have that saying, cursed is anyone who hangs from a tree. How could the Messiah be a cursed person? To many Second Temple Jews, this doesn't make any sense. Not only that, but to most other religions and other cultures in the area immediately surrounding believing Christians of the time, believing on a human being who actually has conquered and actually has provided salvation to, to his believers, who's dead who was crucified also doesn't make any sense. If you think about another uh, popular deity of the time, he either went by the, the name of Jupiter or Zeus. His whole thing was that Zeus slash Jupiter could pretty much do what he wanted. He was just so freaking strong, right? Well, so this needs some explaining. And the immediate concern for the author of Ephesians was that in this melting pot of ideas and theologies, what exactly are we to understand about this weird religion where the, the God that isn't around has already done everything. So what do we do? And what I mean by that is that, to a second temple Jew going to synagogue and reflecting on, let's just say, uh, the Torah and understanding the, the old sacrificial system and thinking about the things that are happening in the temple in Jerusalem. That was a big part of what they believed about how the God, the creator God of the universe wanted them to behave. And so the earliest Christians being a sect of this Judaism, the natural conflict came about when there started to be people who were believers that this, this second temple Jew, Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, but they're not Jews. So what do we do? Say I say I'm from Ephesus and I used to I used to trust in my worship of Artemis. And as I continued to worship Artemis, I could trust that Artemis was going to take care of me and protect me and give life to me and my family and uh and supply me with all the prostitutes that I could ever want. What the author of Ephesians is trying to explain is that the new hope that we have the mercy and grace that has been given to you who are at Ephesus is that you don't need to do any of that anymore. That's very confusing in the ancient world. The idea of worship itself was mostly defined by what you did, not what you believed. Which brings us to one of the things that gets talked about a lot with Ephesians. I know people uh, I know people who will readily tell you that this is their favorite verse. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own. 
It is the gift of God. Now, you'll remember that the author had already built this big case and used all these different, all this different language and these these broad metaphors to understand that that uh, your salvation, your status, your justification before this God that you say you believe in is not determined by what you do. It's determined by what he did, what he does, and what he is doing. Well, this is just throwing everything all out of whack now. So now, if God does all the work of my religion, what on earth are we, am I supposed to do about it? It has been talked about for hundreds and hundreds of years. And if we look back on the history of the way that this passage has been interpreted, we run into uh, some famous uh, conversations that were happening with the reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther. But when we read and when we engage with what theologians like John Calvin and Martin Luther and people of their time uh, were thinking about and discussing when reading Ephesians, we need to understand that they were not Second Temple Jews and they were not first century Gentiles. See, when they read, uh, for it is by grace that, grace that you are saved, it is uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. When they heard that, they thought of the Catholic Church as being analogous to the old uh, Judaism in the ancient days. They thought of ancient Jews as backwards. Um, stuck in this bloviated religion built on rites and and ceremony, and that somehow these ancient Jews uh, were so confused about their own God that they had come to trust on their rituals and their and their ceremonies and their sacrifices to be their salvation. Unfortunately for, for Martin Luther and John Calvin, and quite frankly, a lot of Christians that talk about this passage in our current day, they don't seem to have picked up on the fact that what Paul's making the case for is reminding Second Temple Jews in the context of their new Gentile friends that their religion and their hope for salvation has never been any works. See, in Ephesians, whether or not someone's practicing the law of Moses is not really in view because these, if whatever amount of believing Jews there were in Ephesus, they didn't have access to the sacrificial system at the temple. The temple was a really long journey for them. What they did to practice their Judaism, which was common for a lot of the first century Second Temple Jews, was that they got together and read through and studied the Torah and talked about it and preached about it. Not dissimilar to a lot of ways that a lot of other religions. But they were not practicing sacrifices. And therefore, the author in Ephesians was never addressing or talking about the sacrificial works of the temple when it came to salvation. The typical understanding of Second Temple Jewish thought was that salvation was from the Lord. As a matter of fact, they would reflect on this when they would read things like the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4, or when they would read the story of Moses, where we get the phrase, salvation is of the Lord. See, Paul's not going at the Jews and telling them to straighten up. He's trying to help Gentiles understand Christianity in the context of interacting with these other early Christians. It, what did need to be explained to Jewish believers of the time was that these Gentiles did not need to be Jewish. Paul will later use the term circumcision and he'll talk about 
he'll talk about circumcision. But one thing that we need to understand about circumcision in the context of which Paul's writing, no one thought, I shouldn't say that, virtually no one believed that the act of circumcision was what was going to bring about their salvation. That's not in view. Circumcision was merely being brought into a covenant that God made with Abraham in their nation's origin story. But with that, early Christians who tended to be Jewish still had the understanding that the covenant relationship needed to be entered in by becoming Jewish. This does not change that being Jewish does not require any works for any amount of justification or salvation. That is not what's in view. Paul is trying to help Gentiles understand their new Christian context, and he's also trying to help Jewish believers understand that these Gentiles don't need to become Jewish because they already know that salvation is not about any works. If salvation isn't about any works, then these Gentiles who are coming into the fold of faith do not need to be circumcised because then it would be them doing something. Paul and most believing Second Temple Jews understood that circumcision was a sign. The, the confusion was in Ephesus, does this Gentile need to become Jewish? And Paul's building the case. I've already reminded you that salvation is of the Lord. This whole thing, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the coming of a new heaven and a new earth, the inauguration of a new age, a new eschatological age. This whole thing's being redone, not through the Abrahamic covenant, but in and through Jesus. It's merely shifting the faith. The faith is always in God, but understanding that God is working on something new now. Think about it this way. If I were to build a house and my contractor was just an incredibly old man, an incredibly old man, and I said, hey, I'm building a house. And he said, all right. And then he sent me a bill for one X for a thousand yards of asbestos that needs to be installed as insulation of my house. We now know that that is not a necessary thing to be done to my house. However, we do all understand that my house needs insulation. And so what Paul is talking about is don't make Gentiles put asbestos in their homes. This is the insulation they need. Because God has moved the covenant from being Jewish and now everything everything was in Israel and it's it's now in Jesus Christ. We were looking for the Messiah and now we have the Messiah. So we no longer need to think about God in terms of looking for the Messiah. You don't need to do the, the, the things of the Abrahamic covenant because we're no longer in that covenant. And so Paul establishes that case by talking about how it, we all know it was never the works, but by insisting that these Gentiles do something now, you're adding a work. So the mistake that some of the early reformers and Protestants continue to make today was that Paul was not refuting. He was not correcting the Jewish religion and saying that they've got the gospel wrong and that they need to just immediately stop being Jews. No, 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 no. What he was saying was you don't need to make anybody Jewish because 
It was never about making anyone do anything. There was a covenant under Abraham, and it was through Jesus that that covenant, that covenant is completed. The contract is terminated. Nobody else needs to come under that contract anymore. And as a matter of fact, if you were to go under that contract, you would be doing something to earn a salvation. But we tend to think, in terms of the, the reformers, we tend to think, oh, Paul is saying that the Jews got it all wrong and they had their faith in works. No. Paul was saying, we already know that our faith is not based on works, so it doesn't make sense to ask Gentiles to work to become a Jew. I'm working slightly backwards, but I think that was all important to understand the context. And, and, and again, like I said, the purpose and occasion for the letter. But the other thing that I find interesting is the language that Paul uses at the beginning of this chapter two, what that we looked at here is that he uses this life and death metaphor. And I remember, I remember being in church as a young, young kid. And, um, and it was often put to me like this. So it would be something along the lines of you were dead in sin. And so your flesh was, it had no life. And so you got saved and the spirit comes into your life and now you have life. But that's not really what the text says, is it? You can examine it more, more closely. You are dead through the trespasses, through the trespasses and your sins, in which you once lived. Uh, now, either Paul is dumb or he's intentionally giving us a paradox. I tend to believe that the author of Ephesians is not dumb, which meant that when he talks about death and then immediately describes that death by using the language of life, I believe that he meant to do that. It was not an accident. And so by doing that intentionally, he's trying to show you something important. You were dead through the trespasses and your sins in which you once lived following the course of this world. Now I ask you, does a dead person follow anything? No, he's talking about a life. He's talking about living a certain way. Following the ruler and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among us, or among those, excuse me, who are disobedient. Now, when it comes to interpreting and understanding biblical text, you might become frustrated because the context is so important. I remember in the King James Version, it uses language like the prince and power of the air for that same section. The prince and power of the air. What is he talking about? And it's easy for our modern way of thinking to think of like, well, he's talking about Satan. Satan is ruling and making all the decisions. And Satan can... Satan can make this country inter Satan can make this country do this and Satan can knock books off of my shelf like a poltergeist. But that's not how Paul thought about the spiritual realm. That's not how people in the first century thought about the spiritual realm. Do you remember when I said that each city had its own patron deity? See, when, when one city-state or one culture or one people group went to war with another one, and you can see this in the Old Testament, when they went to war with each other, it was not the nation of Israel against the Ammonites. Not in the way that they thought. No. It was Yahweh 
against whoever the patron deity of the Ammonites would have been. And so when Paul's talking about the princes and powers of the air, he's taking a shot at Artemis. He's saying, hey, your life that you live is being ruled and reigned over by your patron deity, Artemis. Or insert your patron deity here. And so what he's saying is that if you live and breathe a culture that is lascivious and the economy is based on prostitution, whoremongering, sacrificial, ritualistic prostitution, institutional slavery, if you live and breathe in that culture, it's a culture of death and you're being ruled over by that patron deity. You're being ruled, your life is being brought to death by being ruled over Artemis. If you read through a lot of the Hebrew Bible, and I remember being in Sunday school, I would be really confused sometimes because I didn't understand who Baal was. And it's funny to say Baal because all of my Sunday school teachers were Northeastern regular white people, right? And so they weren't particularly interested in properly pronouncing these ancient uh, deities and their names. And there was always these stories about Elijah and the Baal worshipers or Elisha and the Baal worshipers or uh, Ahab and his worship of the Baals. And I'm just like, what is a Baal? I don't understand what this is Baal is. Well, it turns out that depending on where you lived in the ancient Near East, Baal had a certain amount of characteristics. And Baal was an extremely aggressive, powerful thunder god who would conquer and he had control over the weather and he could throw lightning bolts and he was often described in terms of being on a chariot of clouds or the rider on the storm. If you've ever heard that song, Rider on the Storm, it's it's an ancient Near Eastern idea of a deity who rules over the skies itself. And so living in that culture was very harsh because their God was harsh. Their God was about punishing evildoers and punishing people who didn't worship. It was very, it was a very punishing deity to be under. But as you lived in a culture and you breathed that culture and you did commerce in that culture and you interacted with other people who believed in different gods and their God wasn't quite as aggressive as yours or their God didn't have quite the same attributes as yours, it would get ugly because you would start to take on or be trained in the culture that your God had been ascribed. And so there's a cycle of a city or a people group projecting their cultural identity onto this God who then rules over that culture and determines the very way they live. And so when Paul talks about the princes and power of the air, what he's talking about is taking on the identity, the personality, the flaws, the sins of your culture's way of life. And that isn't to downplay or omit a, a real spirit of evil in the world. But what Paul's saying is that your culture is a manifestation of that evil spirit in the world. And by nature, being a Christian must push back against that. Living in Ephesus requires that you do not live a life that is reflective of the way Artemis would have you live. Because it leads to death. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh. Who's them? Well, you lived amongst the gods who ruled your people group, your area, your city, following the desires of the flesh and senses. And remember, we talked about how 
being a fertility god, Artemis was a very sensual goddess. And we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. You see, what Paul was trying to get at with the language of the prince and power of the air was that the very evil spirit that works in the hearts of men is the way that everyone else is behaving. Being a Christian in Ephesus required that you live in a way that was in opposition to Artemis. Living in a way that is Christian in, in our world today requires that you live in opposition to the way everyone else thinks. That doesn't mean denying truth. What it means is if there's a real true spirit of evil that works in every culture, like the way Paul is thinking, the way that most people think is based on the influence of that culture. You need to think differently about things. You the belie- you being the believer. It's a necessity to think and live like a Christian in opposition to the prince in power of the air. When Paul uses that phrase, he's not thinking of a red devil with horns and a tail. He's thinking about whatever it is that your culture worships in your place in time and space. But then the author says, but God, who is rich in his mercy. Remember, this new way of life is not something that you do. It's something that God is giving to you. Out of the great love that he loved you with, even when we were dead, through our trespasses. See, to reduce this passage down to you were dead in sin, now you're alive in Christ, it's not quite what Paul is getting at here. He's switching back and forth uh, between life and death in a very artistic, poetic way. He's contrasting life with death, and he's contrasting life and death with both living in the flesh and living in the spirit by the mercy of God. That's a different picture than the one I was taught in Sunday school. Even when we were dead through our trespasses made us alive. Remember you were alive in your death, but remember also that the author of Ephesians here wants us to understand that the covenant is now in Christ. So then he says, Even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. It is by grace you have been saved. And raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards towards us in Jesus Christ. See, again... In this very short passage of the, of the text, Paul repeatedly hits the nail on the head that whatever this new life is supposed to be, our justification and position in that new life is only in Jesus. It's no longer in the Abrahamic covenant. It's no longer in the hope of the Messiah. It's in the arrival of and resurrection of the Messiah. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. 